Hello and welcome everyone to our uh, June edition of the uh, North Atlantic uh, chapter of the ISPD Central Time Zone Journal Club. Uh, uh, today uh, we're going to have uh, Dr. Connor Grantham present to us uh, for this month's medical school and did his residency at University of Kansas uh, before coming over here to Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, for his nephrology fellowship. He's one of our first year uh, nephrology fellows. And today he's going to be talking to us about peritonitis related colonoscopies, incidents, and protocols. Connor, take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. El Shami, and uh, appreciate your guidance in helping curate this presentation. Um, if anybody has any questions or concerns, feel free to raise your hand or just interrupt me. Um, and hopefully, if somebody's watching the chat, just Give me a shout out as well as any questions might arise during our presentation. Um, this was an article that came out about a month ago, and I thought it would be a good topic to talk about today um, because thinking about peritonitis related colonoscopies, I learned a lot of new stuff about um, management as well as some pathophysiology about this whole process. Um, and I do think it's an area where um, we might not think about it enough, and there's a lot of room for opportunity in terms of education and um, improvement for management for a lot of our patients who are getting ready for um, some invasive procedures. Um, so with that, I'll get started. Um, as is tradition, I have no disclosures to tell anybody about. And um, just a brief overview of where we're going to go. We'll give some background as well as some introduction, review a little bit of pathophysiology. We'll talk about the, tri the um, study itself as well as the design and the methods the results and outcomes, and we'll have some room for discussion and analysis here at the end. Um, so starting off, as we all know, peritonitis is a major complication of peritoneal dialysis, and it's a primary reason why folks have to switch from PD to hemodialysis. Uh, this can lead to hospitalization, technique failure, and worst of all, mortality. There are some important modifiable risk factors, um, including recent invasive interventions. So colonoscopy, sigmoidoscopy, cystoscopy, and hysteroscopy, or dental procedures. So knowing that our PD patients may be getting ready for a procedure provides an opportunity for us to prevent a bad outcome from happening. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the literature on some of these studies. And there was one study of 79 CAPD patients undergoing colonoscopies without prophylactic antibiotics, and they had a risk of developing peritonitis at about 6.2%. Um, there were similar results that were observed in another study of patients on PD um, who underwent about 99 endoscopies, and I'll talk about those studies in more detail. Um, the pathophysiology or the thought process behind it, um, you know you have your risk of developing peritonitis just from the dialysis procedure, um, but then there's also further risk by these invasive procedures. Um, there's the introduction of microbes to the usually sterile peritoneum, and this can be related to the dialysis, but um, there's sort of this translocation of normal gut flora that can occur due to instrumentation or things like biopsies and tissue injury. Um, and at our baseline, um, I think it's important that we remember that our P PD patients do have compromised host defenses already. Um, this is in large part due to the continuous presence of a large amount of fluid in the peritoneal cavity. So the dialysate present, prevents close proximity of mesothelial surfaces. So it's more difficult for the gut to entrap bacteria and lead to those um, processes that can eliminate abnormal gut, abnormal bacteria. There's also dilution of macrophages and cytokine levels. The fluid itself may, provoke, may promote microbial growth, particularly if they're high in sugar concentration. And the pH and the osmolality actually inhibit peripheral blood leukocyte activity. And then when we're doing the dialysis, there is removal of resident macrophages and cytokines during the exchanges. And then some other factors that may contribute to developing peritonitis is just the fragile gastric mucosa for a lot of our patients who may be on anticoagulation, any platelets, steroids, or have some other chronic inflammatory disease. Um, there are also other additional risk factors um, that we need to keep an eye on that may lead to development of peritonitis, and that includes hypokalemia, which may slow gut motility. Hypoalbuminemia, a lot of our folks may be um, malnourished or as well. Constipation, diabetes, 
Um, we always ask about pets in the home to make sure that they have a safe, clean environment to do the peritoneal dialysis. Um, maybe something that's also under recognized is the role of depression and um, lack of self-care that can occur with a lot of our chronically ill folks. And then intra-abdominal pathology of just about any kind uh, can lead to increased risk of peritonitis as well. And so the ISPD peritonitis guideline um, recommendations did have an update in 2022 as far as the prevention and treatment. And they specifically addressed invasive gastrointestinal and gynecologic procedures. Um, the recommendation was for antibiotic prophylaxis prior to colonoscopy and invasive gynecological procedures, as well as um, drainage of PD fluid to keep the abdomen empty before endoscopic gastrointestinal and invasive uh, procedures. Um, you will note that uh, these recommendations get a 2C and 2D rating, which just means that the availability of the evidence is low quality at the moment. Um, but we'll kind of dive further into that as well during this presentation. So, in one of these studies that we mentioned earlier, they had they looked at 77 CAPD patients who underwent 97 colonoscopies. Um, 18 cases got antibiotics prior to the colonoscopy, and it's important to note that none of them developed cases of peritonitis if they got antibiotics. Um, among those without antibiotic prophylaxis, there were four episodes of peritonitis that occurred within 24 hours, um, and there was one that occurred five, day, five days later, and we'll speak more about the definitions, um, but they do define peritonitis. Um, colonoscopy-related peritonitis is development of peritonitis within one week of the procedure. So colonic biopsy and polypectomy in this study was not associated with more peritonitis. So there were two in 41 with biopsy versus three uh, episodes in 38 patients without biopsy. Um, one in 30 with polypectomy versus four cases of peritonitis and 49 without polypectomy. And we'll talk a little bit more about this as well, but um, it, did it did raise a point of conflict, um, essentially. This is a, a separate study that was retrospective multi-center um, that looked at CAPD patients who underwent colonoscopy from January of 2003 to December of 2012. Um, they saw 236 patients on CAPD underwent colonoscopy with 9 or 3.8 percent developing peritonitis. Um, prophylactic antibiotics were prescribed before colonoscopy in 65 patients with none of these folks developing peritonitis, uh, which um, kind of goes along with our theme of today's talk. Um, no patient who developed peritonitis received prophylactic antibiotics. So the folks who got sick did not have antibiotics given. And then the rates of polypectomy and endoscopic mucosal resection were significantly higher in the peritonitis group in this study than in the no peritonitis group. So this is where we get some sort of uh, conflicting results in our studies. Um, and we'll talk more about this as well. And here is a third study um, that was a retrospective analysis from February 2001 and to February 2012 that looked at 125 endoscopies in 45 patients, um, eight or 6.4 percent um, peritonitis episodes developed after the examination, and antibiotics were used in 26 procedures, and those folks who received antibiotics did not get peritonitis, zero percent, versus the 8.1 percent without antibiotic use. The peritonitis rate was significantly higher in the non-EGD group uh, than in the EGD group. So uh, some, these, this study looked at a bunch of different procedures aside from just colonoscopies. They looked at like sigmoidoscopies, upper scopes each with EGD, as well as um, uh, cytoscopies and other things, and saw that uh, there was just a higher rate of peritonitis in folks who got these other procedures that were not EGDs than the folks in the EGD group. So it may lead to some oh, yeah. different. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, real quick, Dr. Goldberg, I know it has his hand up. Uh, uh, Tom T, do you want to uh, bring up a point or ask a question? Yeah, so, uh, Connor, when you report these studies uh, and you talk about antibiotics administered prophylactically or not, did you look at whether they went into the procedure dry or not. And are you going to discuss that later or uh, where, where is it reported in these cases where you're talking about antibiotics? 
Yeah, um, I will definitely talk about the dry abdomen. Um, they did report that in the study that we're going to go into more depth. Um, some of these studies actually, unfortunately, did not give more details about the dry abdomen versus wet abdomen, um, as well as the length or duration of some of their antibiotics. So I was missing a little bit of information for a couple of these studies. Cool. All right. And then, so just to piggyback, um, as I sort of mentioned earlier, um, in, this, in this study, antibiotic use prior to non-EGD examination significantly reduced uh, the endosco endoscopy-associated peritonitis rate. Um, and like I said, the non-EGD group was comprised of patients who got colonoscopy, sigmoidoscopy, cystoscopy, hysteroscopy, as well as IUD implantation and removal. So a couple of other procedures to think about as far as uh, managing our PD patients. So that brings us to um, this uh, study that uh, was reported in Peritoneal Dialysis International uh, titled Clinical Characteristics and Outcomes of Peritoneal Dialysis Related Peritonitis After Colonoscopy. Um, this was published online about a month ago, um, and this is the group who conducted the study as well. And so, as we talked about in our background session, uh, colonoscopy is known to increase the risk of PD-related peritonitis um, with some varying rates from 3.8 to 8.5 percent is what had been reported originally. Um, the ISPD guidelines in 2022 suggested antibiotic prophylaxis for these patients. Um, however, the prophylactic regimen, or the most optimal one, had not yet been well established. So it was one of the goals of this study when they were investigating the clinical characteristics and outcomes of colonoscopy-related peritonitis. Um, they also wanted to see if they could find an optimal prophylactic antibiotic regimen, or at least think more closely about what, how we could better take care of our folks with PD who are getting um, invasive procedures. So the design was a retrospective study at the nephrology unit of Pamela U. Nethersole Eastern Hospital in Hong Kong. Um, they looked at PD patients who had a colonoscopy between January 1st, 2009 to December 31st, 2019, so almost 11 years. Um, and they compared demographic data between patients with and without colonoscopy-related peritonitis. Um, and in folks who were diagnosed with peritonitis, they looked at, they tried to identify what the causative organisms were, um, the onset time or how quickly they became ill, as well as the outcomes of these patients after they were diagnosed with peritonitis. Um, some definitions, uh, they defined peritonitis as a patient who had at least two of the following, and that was abdominal pain and or cloudy PD fluid, uh, total fluid cell count greater than 100, um, and three, positive culture in peritoneal fluid effluent. Peritonitis that developed within one week after colonoscopy was defined as colonoscopy-related peritonitis. And interestingly, in, at this center, their prophylactic regimen for antibiotics was a single dose of IV, IV cefuroxime, 750 milligrams. And if the patient had a cephalosporin allergy, they were given a single dose of IV levofloxacin, 500 milligrams. Um, and in this uh, study, PD fluid was drained before colonoscopy and patient kept the abdomen uh, dry. And then if the patient was diagnosed with peritonitis, it was treating according to ISPD guidelines with a combination of daily IP, cefazolin, and ceftazidine. Um, they did follow a uh, standard for indications for PD catheter removal, which included failure to respond to antibiotics by day five, intra-abdominal complications such as ileus or bowel perforation, and uncontrolled sepsis with uh, hemodynamic instability. Um, and then they used uh, continuous variables were expressed as a mean plus minus standard deviation um, analyzed by students t test categorical variables were compared by chi square tests so those were the statistics that they used so we'll take a look at the results so over this time period they identified 1478 episodes of pd related peritonitis so that's peritonitis all encompassing the rate was 0 0.37 episodes per patient year they were able to identify 74 patients who underwent 115 colonoscopies and had 14 cases of colonoscopy related peritonitis. So for this, this was about 12.2%, which was uh, significantly higher than what had been reported in prior studies. 
Um, they were not able to identify a significant difference in the patient's age, which could be a risk factor for peritonitis, dialysis vintage, how long they've been doing the PD, uh, PD modality. They looked at history of peritonitis itself, bowel prep quality, antibiotic use before, uh, colonoscopy, serum, potassium, and albumin uh, between the patients um, was also similar. So a couple of the other important modifiable risk factors for uh, prevention of peritonitis. Um, one of, what this study did show was that polypectomy was more common in patients who did develop uh, colonoscopy-related peritonitis, 78.6% versus 35.6%. And there were a higher proportion of patients with peritonitis were diagnosed with colonic polyps and diverticulosis compared with non-peritonitis group. And then this is the table, again, kind of rehashing um, the characteristics that they were analyzing. Um, there was some difference in the absolute numbers, like the group that developed peritonitis was older at 70.4 versus 67.7 in the group that did not develop peritonitis, uh, but a p-value of 0.4 was not statistically significant. Um, so you can see there was some a little bit of differences um, between the two groups that just didn't uh, wasn't backed up from a statistical analysis. Um, some other things that were notable were the a number of folks who were prescribed antibiotics before colonoscopy. Then the folks that developed peritonitis, 71.4% still got antibiotics prior to the procedure, um, with eight getting cefuroxamine and two with levofloxacin. However, um, it was only 56.4% that got antibiotics in the non-peritonitis group. Um, which I thought was sort of interesting. Um, bowel preps were statistically similar, although it looked like the peritonitis group had a better preparation than the non-peritonitis group. Um, uh, but the other important stuff here was the, the group that did develop peritonitis had significantly more polyps than the group that did not develop peritonitis, as well as them getting treatment with polypectomy during the colonoscopy versus the group that did not develop peritonitis. So what happened to those folks who were diagnosed with peritonitis? Connor, yep. if you don't mind, uh, uh, can you go back uh, to that slide? Because I think this is a very important slide, right? Um, mm -hmm. So you, you can keep the uh, the red uh, squares that you had there before, too. So, you know, you, you brought up, I think, very important points, right? So uh, the percentage of patients that were treated with antibiotics in the peritonitis group was higher than the percentage of patients that were treated with antibiotics and the, the you know the non-peritonitis group and really the emphasis here is you know how efficacious are antibiotics in preventing peritonitis occurrence in patients who have polyps right that require polypectomy right um i uh, i mean you can see that there are 12 patients that have polyps 11 required uh, polypectomies, right? So basically almost all of them. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, I don't think that having a polyp alone predisposes you to having, great. Right? Like, that's not what we want to take. I'm not, and I'm not saying that that's what you implied either, right? But I think that somebody looking at it saying, okay, just the presence of polyps alone increases the risk uh, of uh, having peritonitis. Um, that being said, um, I haven't proved otherwise. Uh, right, <laughs> buy it. Now, if these patients, the only way to do that is if you had patients who had polyps like this and you did no intervention on purpose. Mm -hmm. um, but then again, something about, right, the procedure, right, of the polypectomy that uh, clearly uh, increases the risk of uh, peritonitis development despite antibiotic treatment uh, in these patients. And I think that would be the take home message, uh, take home message here and something for us to also talk about afterwards in the discussion. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. I think, um, having a polyp is more of a predictive, uh, factor for getting a polypectomy. Um, and that's, um, something that we can see there and the polypectomy may have more to do with the development of peritonitis than having the polyp itself. Cool. Okay. All right. And so moving on, um, what happened to our folks who were the 14 patients who were diagnosed with peritonitis? Well, 10 responded to medical treatment, while four had to have their PD catheters removed. Uh, there was one patient who had their PD catheter reinserted and was able to resume uh, peritoneal dialysis. However, two had to be converted to hemodialysis. Uh, one patient, unfortunately, succumbed to severe polymicrobial peritonitis despite catheter removal, and one patient 
was able to respond to medical treatment, but died from a hospital acquired pneumonia. So the researchers then followed up and tried to identify the different organisms that were the culprit for the peritonitis and found um, a pretty good group of E. coli with eight of those cases, um, and then two were Klebsiella, and then sort of a hodgepodge of other species as well, including Enterococcus, Aramona, Acinetobacter, Stenotrophomonas, Strep, and Polymicrobial. Um, interesting, ESPL were positive in four E. coli and two Klebsiella strains, and 60% of gram-negative organisms were sensitive to gentamicin and levofloxacin, um, with 40% were sensitive to ampicillin, and only 33% were sensitive to cefuroxime, which, as you might recall, was the antibiotic of choice for prophylaxis for these folks. So, in the author's discussion session, um, there was a they noted there's a substantially higher rate of colonoscopy-related peritonitis in this patient cohort than in previous studies, um, with a significant portion of ESBL-producing organisms. Um, polypectomy was more common in the peritonitis group for this study, um, and as we sort of reviewed at the beginning, there had been one other study that demonstrated increased risk of peritonitis with polypectomy in two studies that demonstrated no increase in risk as well. This study showed a higher proportion of patients with peritonitis had polyps and diverticulosis as well, as sort of an aside. Um, and the authors did note that it was difficult to discern if there was other colon pathology that was contributing to their peritonitis as well. Um, and the authors postulated that the outcomes in this study were worse due to a significantly older patient population and longer dialysis vintage. And this was their second table, which showed that, um, you know, their group who developed peritonitis was around um, 70 years of age, and the, those without were around 67. And here are some prior studies that looked at um, peritonitis, uh, peritonitis as well with groups here in the 50s and 60s of age. And then um, the folks here who developed peritonitis were on dialysis for about on average 54 months um, compared to these other studies that showed folks just a little over 30 months of uh, being on PD. So only 33% of gram-negative bacteria isolated were sensitive to cefuroxime, um, and so the authors concluded that their prophylactic antibiotic regimen was likely inadequate. Um, in the 2022 ISPD guidelines, um, the options for antibiotics that they had suggested were ceftriaxone or ceftazidime, amoxicillin clavulonate, ampicillin sulbactam, or an ampicillin plus aminoglycosides. Um, and then um, the authors also commented on a recent case series about 49 PD patients who received oral ciprofloxacin ampicillin with or without metronidazole and showed no post-procedure peritonitis. Um, and then I was, I was looking at some of the other recommendations and up to date the website um, for their antibiotic regimen, they recommend a single IP dose of gentamicin, 160 milligrams, in the overnight well, one night prior to the procedure, along with oral metronidazole, 500 milligrams, four times a day for three days, starting the day before the procedure. And there were quite a few limitations with this study. It's a retrospective study. Um, some patients were on antibiotic treatment for reasons other than peritonitis prophylaxis, and the authors had a tough time figuring out um, if that was the case why that may have been, if they were receiving treatment for another infection or if they were actually getting their prophylactic regimen. Um, they made an interesting point that the data was collected over 11 years, and so there may be potential changes in the demographic pattern as well as antibiotic susceptibility and management of peritonitis, as well as prophylactic management. The ISPD had, rec had um, updated their recommendations in 2016, so that could have potentially contributed um, to how things had changed. Um, and it was a single center. Um, antibiotic resistance patterns may not reflect global patterns. So um, what causative organisms may be present in Hong Kong may not be the same here in the United States. So that's one thing to consider. Um, and a fairly solid, small sample as well. Like I mentioned, they looked at studies over 11 years and only had 14 cases of colonoscopy-related peritonitis. So was only, they were unable to perform more subgroup analysis of the risk factors for multidrug-resistant microorganisms. 
So overall, the risk of peritonitis in this study was 12.2%. Polypectomy was more commonly done in colonoscopy-related peritonitis. Uh, Multidrug-resistant organisms are an emerging cause of colonoscopy-related peritonitis at this center. Um, and the authors concluded that there's need for a large-scale study to investigate the antibiotic sensitivity pattern of the causative microorganisms and to delineate the effect antibiotic of antibiotic prophylaxis. So with that, um, I did kind of want to... Yeah. Before we delve into uh, discussion topics, uh, you know, there's a great question in this chat from CGC. CG, do you want to ask a question or uh, I can read it uh, for you, but uh, probably better if you... Uh, Sure. I'm just wondering, uh, all this colonoscopy, is it for indication, like GIP, weight loss, or is it just every 10 years surveillance? I'm not sure how this practice in Hong Kong is. You yeah. probably didn't uh, mention it. Yep. So for the indications for colonoscopy, um, it looked like the most of them were done. Uh, the indication was anemia. Um, there were some uh, incidents for rectal bleeding, diarrhea. Um, and then follow up of colon polyps and colon cancer, and then screening for colon cancer. Um, the numbers overall are pretty small, but it is something we should think about more because a lot of our PD patients are going to be um, more robust than our chronic hemodialysis patients. A lot of them are going to be more likely to be transplant candidates. And so they are the ones who are going to be needing a lot of that diagnostic workup and, and evaluation um, if they're eventually going to be a transplant. So stay on that slide, uh, Connor, uh, Dr. Gupta. Uh, you know, you wrote a comment in the in the chat. If you'd like to share it with us. Yeah, I think it is also interesting to know uh, to just to observe that the patients who develop peritonitis, majority of one, a majority of them, they had an inpatient colonoscopy. So do they mention like maybe the patient they were already sick to begin with? They were admitted with some other issues. Yeah, they didn't uh, comment specifically, or I couldn't find that they analyzed exactly why they were hospitalized or inpatient, but that's a really good point. Um, you know, at their baseline, if they're going to be more frail or already ill, it would stand to reason they're going to be at increased risk to develop peritonitis already. Well, it is interesting, though, is that there was significant difference between the two groups though, in terms of peritonitis development, but it, but it would also be um, interesting to see how long they were admitted, how sick were these patients, because I think that adds more context, uh, you know, like Dr. Gupta said, rather than just, you know, was this inpatient, outpatient, right? A patient who's been inpatient for a while, it was a, a abdominal pathology at the time, or, you know, other issues with bacteremia or stuff like that, then I think that that would be important, but um, you know, as we know, we manage patients a lot in the hospital who require a colonoscopy inpatient because of anemia, but they're, they've been bacteremic as well and getting IV antibiotics and, you know, other other issues. Uh, can I can I clarify where that point is going? Uh, and let me let me semi answer my question. I'm not sure what difference it makes. Uh, the whole idea here is that colonoscopy is a risk for peritonitis and whether they had 400 other risk factors prior to it, that, that's still a moot point. It's still a risk factor for peritonitis. So uh, uh, help me, am I missing something, uh, uh, Nuper and Osama, with regards to that hospital business? Yeah, I think it adds more context, right? So when when you look at it, from my perspective at least, when you look at a study, and this study kind of stands out in terms of the rate of peritonitis compared to previously published studies, uh, maybe, you know, uh, the context of these patients in that center was different from those in prior studies, and that's why they had much higher uh, colonoscopy-related peritonitis rates compared to, you know, these other three prior studies. So it could play a role. Now, uh, Dr. Rabi, you shared a point uh, as well uh, earlier uh, in the discussion about uh, ADPKD and diverticular. Do you want to elaborate on this uh, for us? Uh, I mean, just what's obvious. I mean, they, you know, they have a lot of diverticular. They got, you know, hernias and pouches and valve disease and cysts everywhere. So I always worry about putting somebody. Uh, just alone, I've had a few people, PKD patients fail just because their peritonitis rate is so high, presumably, and it's, you know, I don't do it from a, if it's a staph epi, but it's a lot of times it's a gram negative, and 
maybe not on the first time, but their second peritonitis, it's to me, it's failure time. So I just would wonder, you know, if that would be a even a bigger risk factor. Um, uh, just having, you know, I see it's diabetes here, and but you know, it didn't break it down into other diseases. It's not a common disease. Um, <clears throat> I found this kind of interesting because, you know, I'd always thought, and I haven't looked this up in a while, that the recommendations were if you're going to do a biopsy, you should give them prophylactic antibiotics. If you're not going to do a biopsy, they didn't need it. Now, this is not kind of the way it's supported here, uh, although the polyp, you know, we can't really tweak out the polyp versus polyp biopsy or not. My problem with that original information anyway was the fact that, you know, you don't know what you're going going to find when you get in there anyway. So what, are you going to get in there and then find out there's a polyp and you do a biopsy and then you got to, oh, stop or don't biopsy it and give antibiotics? It's kind of, you know, that's ridiculous. So you're kind of, I think you're kind of obligated to give antibiotics because you didn't know what you're going to do anyway. Now, again, that is if the real risk is from invading and not just doing the procedure itself. Those antibiotic regimens are not easy. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's kind of to think you're going to give uh, genomycin and, and, you know, the night before in a bag is kind of ridiculous to this day and age personally. And it doesn't sound like some of the other things really work that well. So I'm kind of, I'm kind of left confused now what to do. So uh, when you brought up the point about ADPKD, I kind of looked into it because, you know, it is a very important, uh, you know, point and I think it's valid. I did find there was a meta-analysis that was published in 2018 that uh, looked at nine studies that were conducted between 1998 and 2016. I'm trying to share the link, but for some reason, well, let me paste it on but it was the the study is called Outcomes of Polycystic Kidney Disease Patients on Peritoneal Dialysis: Systemic Review of Literature and Meta Analysis, and the conclusion was that PKD is associated with a better global survival, an increased risk of abdominal hernia, but no differences in peritonitis rate or technique survival. Hmm. Include that PD is a safe modality for PKD patients. Uh, but that properly designed controlled studies are needed to, deter to determine whether all PKD patients are eligible for P. I mean, it, I don't think that that, you know, um, negates that point, and neither do I want that to be the take-home message for the listeners and the fellows, right? So uh, clearly the quality of the studies out there, right, it being, you know, retrospective observational uh, studies, um, definitely uh, plays a role and, you know, kind of tempers uh, conclusions that we can uh, come out with from these studies. There is, if you look on the ISPD uh, guidelines, apparently there's only one randomized control trial of prophylactic antibiotic use, and it was done in uh, Saudi Arabia. And talk, talk about feasibility. I think this one is a little bit harder. Uh, in that study, they, uh, they, uh, patients got IP ceftaz one gram one hour before their procedure. And they got 93 patients who uh, didn't have a history of peritonitis in the prior 12 months. And the peritonitis rate did not differ between the two groups that got it and those who didn't get it. 6.5% compared to 8.5% with a p-value of 0.27. Now, I don't know how many of us have patients who uh, can uh, get IP ceftaz an hour before a procedure, right? Have it there and then empty and then go get the colonoscopy and what the exact findings were, but that doesn't sound too feasible to me either. Dr. Rabari, do you have any thoughts, comments, concerns? You want to, uh, you're still muted, Dr. Yu. I'm struck by the high prevalence of peritonitis that is really, really very high. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not aware of any higher incidence of peritonitis in PKD patient. Obviously, it's, the, it's not that common, I mean, among our patients, but still we have had over the years many PKD patients and they don't seem to have any higher incidence of peritonitis. Then they, in terms of the what to give, we have somehow, we have been lucky. We have a very low incidence of peritonitis following colonoscopy. But over the past few years, because there is all this information and the recommendation of the International Society to give antibiotics, we have been paying a lot of attention and giving almost universally antibiotics. Given IV, 
or intraperitoneal antibiotic is very impractical. And it came out this paper that you are mentioning here, the presenter. I, uh, in, in the current paper, there is a reference number 10, which I forgot, unfortunately, the name. I mean, it's Suzuki, it's a Japanese paper web. You mentioned it, where they gave the combination of Cipro, amoxicillin, and, uh, and Flagyl, um, PO, one or two hours before the procedures and found no peritonitis. We have been doing that for the past four years and we have had no peritonitis, but we didn't have too much peritonitis before. And this is not necessarily, I mean, a well-controlled study. That's all what I can tell you. Yeah, so so for, for the listeners who aren't familiar with the study, in this study, they gave ampicillin 1000 milligrams Cipro 500 milligrams and or flagyl or metronidazole 250 milligrams uh, one to two hours before the colonoscopy. Uh, but then again, you know, I don't know um, how I mean, sometimes I struggle even to have my patients take their regular medications, having them make sure to take the pills with them when they're leaving to the hospital and then take it while they're waiting for the procedure. I'm not sure about the feasibility. So, Dr. Yu, do you tell them to take it right before the procedure or do you just have them take it the night before? What's no, your no, no, no. Prior to the procedure. It's the same thing that we train the patient who have, for example, going for a dental procedure and have a valvulopathy to do it a couple of hours, two hours before. The procedure is that kind of uh, is to prevent whatever bacteremia you have in this case. The idea is that there is a passing of bacteria into the peritoneal cavity and there will be enough antibiotics in the blood going into peritoneal cavity that will kill those bacteria. That's the general idea, isn't it? I, at least that's the way I see it. Number two, I, I know that Dr. Goldberg is not going to like this, but I mean, I really don't see that clearly why empty belly is that important. Because I, I really don't see it. Uh, again, everything that is mentioned at the beginning, the pH, again, not very important because as soon as you put PD fluid there, the pH is the same as the blood and so on and so forth. I understand that you have a dilution of the macrophages and all the potential cytokines and all of that. But again, it's the same thing when the patient comes for peritonitis. Forget about colonoscopy. A patient comes with peritonitis to the hospital and he has bacteria. And then what we do is actually we put uh, antibiotics there with PD fluid and we let it dwell there. I, I mean, and it doesn't seem to affect the, the outcome. I'm not so sure that the dryness is really that important. I have so, thoughts on that, but Dr. Goldberg, do you want to comment? Yeah, uh, uh, so uh, evolutionary wise, our mesothelium was designed to eradicate uh, foreign bodies like bacteria. Uh, it, two millimeters separates some of the nastiest organisms from your peritoneum. And if you think for a minute that they aren't slipping through your abdominal wall into your peritoneum, you're nuts because you're wrong. That whether they're coming through diverticuli or other uh, damages to the bowel and, and colonoscopy, by the way, damages the bowel wall. But those mesothelial surfaces touch each other. And they wipe out bacteria left and right. It's happening in all of us, certainly probably over the age of 60, Jaime, you included. Uh, and and, oh, and <laughs> well, maybe especially for you, Jaime, maybe. Wow. But anyway, what I'm getting at is these are called host defenses. And Connor, the reason I sent you that paper is because when we wrote that paper, uh, I reviewed the host defenses as taught to me many years ago by Bill Keene. Bill Keene was a, a nephrologist in at Hennepin, and uh, Bill had done his training in immunology, but he was a nephrologist. And 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 so, and Steve Voss, Bill Keene, and I were very uh, much into host defenses early in the game. And, and Jaime, there's even a paper out of the UK for staph epiperitonitis, where the treatment, the sole treatment alone was to discontinue PD and let the mesothelium take care of it. And it did. Uh, I don't think we're anybody's prepared to do that now, but there isn't that original paper. So the, it, the, the, the rationale for dryness is uh, uh, let the mesothelial surfaces 
do their host defense. That's the rationale. And not only going in dry, but staying dry afterwards. And it goes to what Roger said. Uh, one, I don't know who's going to have a polyp. I don't know who's going to have a polypectomy, and that, nor do I have, no, do I know who might have a potential perforation at the time of the polypectomy. So our policy has been they go in dry, and not just dry by 30 minutes, but dry by hours, uh, and they stay dry for 24 hours afterwards, uh, unless they had a biopsy or a polypectomy, in which case they stay dry for three days. And again, it's all a matter of host defense. And and th th there are no data to support what I'm saying. It's just logic. All right. Now, in order to get by with that extended period without dialysis, if the patients don't have residual kidney function, then we would like to prepare them for that period of going without dialysis. Uh, and I think Connor made the point during his presentation about these are likely to be transplant candidates. And so, uh, uh, the likelihood is high that these fairly healthy people who ought not to have peritonitis and ought not to have diverticulosis uh, are going to be going for uh, a colonoscopy in preparation for their transplant. So it's it's a high likelihood. We, we set a policy with regards to the antibiotics. We have options, but one of the options is the uh, uh, aminoglycoside is stable in the dialysate for uh, 72 hours, certainly 48, probably 72. And they can always put it in uh, uh, either the bag the day before or an overnight bag. So it can be given to them. One, they can fix it themselves if they if they have the vial or, or the bag can be made in the clinic. But right now, the issue of what's the best antibiotic, I won't argue that with anybody. And the Suzuki paper may well be something we should apply. But I feel strongly about several things. One, there should be antibiotics. Uh, and two, there should be a dry period, uh, however long uh, that that's uh, negotiable. So that's a good question. May I ask you, I mean, I understand the philosophy behind makes perfect sense. But then when we deal with peritonitis, patient comes to the hospital, why don't we dry them out, give IV antibiotics and let them the mesothelium? You said that it was an experiment and there is a report in terms of doing it with the staff peritonitis. But in general, then why don't we do that if that is so important? Actually, there are some people who do that. Uh, I, I don't recommend it because I think that the presence of the fluid, Jaime, as you said, uh, helps ease pain, eases pain. Yes. So that yep. tissue is inflamed. So I think the, the, uh, uh, the approach that you take actually could be done uh, if you mollified the pain in some other way. Uh, I, I'm not, I don't think I would like to see a randomized trial of dr dry belly plus intravenous antibiotics versus intraperitoneal. I wouldn't be interested in that. But the, the I think the, the reason we wouldn't want them dry is for pain. So is, is the idea um, that we're floating is that the presence of um, the peritoneal dialysis solution, this is to clarify also for the fellows, um, the presence of the peritoneal dialysis solution interferes with the mesothelium's functionality and ability to fight the infection? Well, that, that's exactly right, plus the two points that Jaime made about the pH of the solution and the uh, pH of the solution and the tonicity of the solution both impair white cell function. So you've got three arguments. Actually, the pH disappears within a few minutes. It is neutralized. And you have two within arguments. Within 30 minutes, within 30 minutes. Yes, I agree. But it's still a shock to the white cells. And the t you can argue the tonicity is going to dissipate within two or three hours. Yes. Um, so, um, we, so we talked about the protocols uh, here. Roger, uh, what do you do in your center? How do you uh, prepare your patients for a colonoscopy? I think we just give them uh, oral... Um, you know, I don't mean to put you on the spot. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's oral. You know, the, with the double one uh, with clavulonic acid, amoxicillin. And, uh, oh, okay. Augmentin. Augmentin. Yeah. Thanks. I think that's what we, you know, do. Uh, hasn't come up much. Um, you know, it's a small end for us lately, but uh, I don't know if that works from what I just read, though. You know, I'm not, I don't <laughs> know what works. Do that's they go the in way. dry, though, Roger? Yeah, I would. Uh, yeah. I would have them go in dry. It just, you know, less distension and everything else, more comfort. And, you know, I'd really thought about everything you guys talked about, wet or dry. 
but I tend to send them everything kind of dry just because it's a little more convenient. And to, to build on the dry arguments on the official ISPD uh, discussion about this, they say the argument for emptying the abdomen uh, before the colonoscopy, for example, is to enhance host defense because the peritoneal macrophage phagocytic function and polymorphonuclear cell function are suppressed by the presence of dialysate. Furthermore, high fluid volumes can compromise the efficiency of bacterial killing by disrupting the volume to surface area ratio. That is the official reasoning given in that ISPD uh, guideline recommendation. Uh, and they the have, fact, they have the, the fact is I'm not aware of any trial where uh, uh, some people, as you know, even forget about this situation, but the regular peritonitis patient come into the hospital with severe pain. Mm -hmm. Some people do one or two exchanges even just to relieve the pain. And that should produce, I mean, that I know that is going to make Tom faint. But I mean, the, because it's really completely against the, this, this concept of uh, allowing the, the, the host defense mechanism. And I'm not aware of any study proving this, but I, I mean, I'm, I may be wrong, proving that doing that against I mean, there are mouse yeah. studies. There, there are, there are, seriously, there are rodent studies uh, to that effect uh, that uh, I think uh, Verbrew and uh, and Voss probably did. But uh, uh, law, I'm thinking of a guy by the name of L A W. But they're they're animal studies. They're not they're not human. So I'm sharing in the in the chat the three uh, like the references that they used. So there are three references that they used to um, uh, to back up uh, this claim for each point about how uh, how that would compromise immunity. Uh, one was published in PDI, the other was published in NDT, and the last one was published in Infection Immunity. So, and they really range anywhere from 1981 publication, 1986, and then 2019. The first one actually has one of our own, Dr. Rachel Fussell, um, but I'm assuming it probably, I don't think it, since it talks about strategies to prevent peritonitis, I don't think it, it's an investigative study of its, of its own, but it probably quotes a paper that references it. Um, but, yeah, but these are the three references for those who are interested about that topic. Connor, are there any questions uh, for the fellows in the conference room? Young, you got a question? Yeah, I was just wondering for the for the ones who got peritonitis, it looks like only ten of them got antibiotics, and uh, and four of them did not. I am assuming so. Were the outcomes worse for the ones who did not get antibiotics? Like they had technique failure, or I don't know the the one that died was it from? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. I couldn't find anything in the article that commented specifically about whether or not the folks who developed peritonitis without antibiotics had worse outcomes than the folks who got antibiotics but still got peritonitis? Um, that's a good question. Any any other questions uh, in the conference room? Nothing in here. Um, any other uh, thoughts by anyone on the panel or participants on the call that want to share their um, experiences or you know bring up interesting uh, thoughts about this uh, interesting topic that you know we deal with every day really with our patients um, i, I, I kind of i had a question for the the group um dr gulper had sent me an article on saturday that kind of raised more questions for me than i i had answers but one of the things that i noticed was there's an infamous case where you know somebody got a colonoscopy a pd patient and nobody from the nephrology team knew and they never got prophylactic antibiotics or anything like that and developed pretty severe peritonitis um, as well i was wondering how do you all um kind of counsel your patients your pd patients about upcoming procedures what are things that they need to be asking from their proceduralist team um, especially when it comes to antibiotics or um, preventative treatment for peritonitis. Dr. Goper, you want to go first? Yes. Uh, I want our uh, home dialysis patients, uh, if they if they sneeze three times in a row, uh, to talk to our <laughs> nurses. <laughs> 
<laughs> and let the nurses decide whether sneezing three times in a row is bad. Mm. And and so the same thing goes with procedures. Wh whatever you're going to have done, talk to us about, uh, if if nothing else, to simply inform us. But there are things that need to be done. And uh, there were two cases, Connor, back to back. Uh, and for those of you at Vanderbilt, you can talk to Ann Chanskin about them. Osama, you should. We had uh, two PD patients. Uh, there had been a change in nursing in the home unit. And so some of this stuff wasn't being transmitted to some of the new patients. And those new patients were the ones likely to get transplant workups. We had, in about a three-month period, two patients that got knocked off PD because of gram-negative peritonitis following in, uh, a colonoscopy in preparation for transplant. Both the colonoscopies were done up in Kentucky. And now I'm not blaming Kentucky. I'm just saying that they weren't our gastroenterologists. The gastroenterologists at Vanderbilt will will uh, raise their own hackles about a PD patient coming in. So they're going to want to see prophylaxis. So the way we handle it is through education during training and, and always talking to them about are any procedures coming up, anything we should know about. So that includes dental, gynecologic, uh, gastrointestinal, uh, uh, anything. So uh, basically, it's done through our nurses. The surveillance is done through our nurses. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, Roger? Yeah, I have a quick question. Um, this dental thing I find very interesting. Um, there was a recent inquiry in ASM communities that asked specifically about that. And I was really, I'll just be honest, I didn't think there was any risk of dental procedures causing peritonitis because to me it's got to get bacteremia first. And that would be determined by the bacteremia prophylaxis, not the perit not the peritoneal dialysis. And so then I looked it up and sure enough, ISPD recommends, as you said earlier, or somebody in the introduction that you give antibiotics before probably invasive dental procedures. I mean, do you guys do that? I mean, you know, Tom sounds like he's on top of everything. If they sneeze three times, they get antibiotics. But, you know, you can't do that either because they'll get, you know, I mean, I think he was he was obviously being cute, which Tom is very good at, by the way. But um, <laughs> but I don't know. Does that even make sense to you that? that, 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 that yeah, I mean, you know, Roger, I think it's there's a lot of parochial practices because there isn't any good clinical trial data. And the transient bacteremia of dental procedures, although no longer indicated for valvular heart disease, at least at our institution, we use it both for our vascular accesses for hemo as well as PD patients. Um, it's parochial, though. It's not evidence-based. Tom, you would agree? And we use Nystatin while they're on it and for seven days after. Yeah, so, I mean, the there isn't here. the right answer. But we are transiently bacteremic when we go to the dentist. That is true. Um, I don't know. But Roger, I uh, I had the same thinking you did a long time ago. Joanne Bargman uh, said, "Oh yeah, it's obvious that to do it." And th then, sure enough, uh, shortly thereafter, we had a case of a strep, uh, an oral strep uh, bacteremia, or I don't mean uh, an oral strep peritonitis following uh, dental. And uh, I just didn't believe it happened. And I don't know how it gets from the bloodstream into the peritoneum. It beats beats me, uh, but it happens. Yeah, I mean, to Julie's point, you know, if we're getting bacteremic all the time, um, which I think I, I do remember some of that going back to medical school, if we get bacteremic that easily, uh, small, small amount doesn't do much. And, you know, if it can, if it, there's enough to get in the peritoneum, I mean, my argument has always been, I can't think of a better place to put a bacteria to grow than, than a peritoneum that's warm sugary and protein and so i don't think it takes very many bacteria compared to maybe the blood you can clear it very easily but not the peritoneum so i think maybe that's the answer yeah, yeah it is a good country I, media. I, I i want my peritoneal uh, dialysis patients to be dry for any procedure uh, uh so i want to argue the host defenses and let me tell you another argument for being dry that's this is weird but 
but particularly for surgeries, you don't know if they're going to have a, a uh, an arrest. You don't know if they're going to have to be resuscitated. And and I you don't want a full belly uh, when somebody's doing resuscitation. So uh, really, for almost any procedure, I I want them dry. Or if there's a perforation, right? Um, that that would be the other thing. But um, so I think. Uh, just a couple more points. I know we just have three more minutes left. So, um, you know, Dr. Goldberg kind of touched on this, uh, and Connor, you talked about this earlier um, uh, in kind of a different way, right? So we talked about the, the sterility of the of the peritoneum, and Dr. Goper, you know, was talking about that there's always some uh, bacterial migration. Now, you know, we'll remind you a few months ago when uh, Dr. Wyatt did uh, her home dialysis journal club, when we were looking at that plot and we did see that there was indeed bacteria present in the peritoneum, just in non-significant amounts, but there was bacteria. I don't know if you remember that, uh, uh, Dr. Goper and uh, Dr. Yu, Roger, I'm not sure if you were on that one or not, but, but you know, we were comparing and you could see that there was some traces of bacteria present uh, in, uh, in the peritoneum. Um, that's one. The other thing is I also wonder, um, well, so that that wait a minute, that was remnant DNA, was it not? It wasn't it DNA marking from the. Uh, it, it wasn't uh, uh, cultures. It was no, no, it wasn't DNA. cultures. It was DNA markings. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That was consistent with bacterial uh, bacterial microbiota. But um, the other thing uh, that I also wonder is uh, how much the effect of the amount of bacteria present in one's GI system have on, I mean, of course, the assumption would be that those with more bacteria than others, right, above average, are more likely to develop, um, you know, colonoscopy-associated peritonitis, uh, right, in those, cases, in those cases. But I wonder if there's been a study looking into quantifying bacterial growth or presence in uh, individual patients' GI systems and how that correlates with the risk of development um, of, uh, you know, colonoscopy-associated peritonitis. All right, so we got one more minute. Um, I think, you know, I'd like, first of all, to thank Connor for a great presentation. Great topic choice, Connor. It's you know very engaging, lively discussions. I really hope we all uh, learn something uh, new today and leave this with um, you know more thoughts and ideas. Uh, anybody who has any thoughts or ideas for our future journal clubs, you know, feel feel free to email me uh, your ideas and we'll take them into consideration as well. Uh, thank you all uh, and to the panel for the discussion. Can uh, I have oh, one minute? Uh, Yes, of course. Go around. So, what what do you guys get out of this? I mean, does it change anything for you, or do you are you more likely, less likely, or I'm I'm, I'm like a, I'm I'm spinning. I'm going Suzuki. That's what I'm gonna do. I'm, I'm going. <laughs> yeah, I think it's better to be safe than sorry. That's what I'm getting out of this, and just like what you know. You, so, what do you give? So uh, the the ampicil the the ampicillin uh, uh, path so ampicillin cipro and flagell three yep okay and that's so far zero infections so I know that's you know, helpful yeah. is that kind of a people shake their head they like that Tom is that you like that oh, I thought we gave uh, uh, the, the protocol in the unit uh, you can do whatever you want but the protocol in the unit was. Uh, uh, aminoglycoside in the bag overnight the night before, and uh, I think ampicillin or amoxicillin orally, I think. Well, I think yeah, that's, that's, that's the protocol, yeah, but uh, I kind of bend it a little bit. <laughs> I, I'm team you. I, I, uh, that, uh, that overnight thing's, a, you know, getting it to them is a kind of a big deal, but uh, yeah. we don't really know, right? We don't know. Yeah. But I mean, nothing's probably not a good idea. Is that the consensus here? We're not 100% sure, but let's err the safe side. Cover more than, you know, cover gram positives, negatives, and uh, even anaerobes is kind of the idea here. Okay. Yep. Thank you. And the gram positive that you're covering is an anaerococcus. All right. Well, thank you all for, uh, for your time, and, uh, and we'll see you next month. Stay tuned. Good topic. Thank you, everybody.